Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation. Making a difference. PSE&G. Committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. ADP. A comprehensive provider of human resources, technology, and services. The New Jersey Education Association. NJIT. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. And by Adler Aphasia Center. Offering therapeutic programming for stroke and brain injury survivors with aphasia. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by New Jersey Family Magazine and njfamily.com. Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. We're about to have a conversation about gun violence. Um, it's respectful, it's civil, but the folks here have very different views on it. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Brett Sabo, who is New Jersey chapter lead. Moms demand action for gun sense in America. Alejandro Rubian, who is, in fact, president and managing editor of New Jersey Second Amendment Society. Good to have you both. Thank you. Thanks for having me. OK, you're, you're in the green room together. Right before, which is actually green, here at NJTV right before you came on. Mm -hmm. You wind up agreeing on any of these issues in the meantime? While we were in the green room? Yeah, like so universal background checks, you agree now on that? I don't know, we didn't talk about that. You didn't talk about that? And you agree on, on the whole question of red law, uh, red laws? Red flag laws. Red flag, red flag laws. laws are what? Well, red flag laws were implemented that uh, people would have their rights removed without any due process. Uh, just by a sheer accusation from a loved one, a family member. Is that how you define them? That's exactly how it's defined by the law. And Hold on. I, one more second. I've read the law. I've read the legislation. It says we will take away your rights with no due process. Please show me that because I've never seen that. Your firearms are taken away from you prior to getting a trial or being charged with a crime. So by claiming you're going to commit a crime or you may commit a crime, is very draconian and it affects a lot of people. And so a whole range of law enforcement professionals are supportive of that because they're concerned about guns getting in the hands of those who are dangerous and have mental health issues or should not have a gun. Is this the due process issue that your colleague describes or the lack thereof? Um, there is plenty of due process built into the law. Um, there, I think it's after 10 days there's a hearing and the whole point of red flag laws is that you get the gun away from the person that could be harming themselves or someone else. And in fact, in states that do have red flag laws, like in Connecticut, um, the gun suicide rate drops almost immediately. Um, and so it's not, it's not about taking people's guns away. But you, aren't it's you about, concerned? But are you in any way concerned about guns being taken away from those who are law-abiding citizens? Aren't you concerned on some level about that? Um, I'm concerned more about the potential danger that parents and teachers and law enforcement could have that they can, um, that they can save other people, they can save their loved one. And then they can get the gun back when, after their hearing, or it's only for a year, yeah. then they can mm. get their this gun back. This is the United States of America, where we're innocent until proven guilty. What Brett just stated makes you guilty until you're proven innocent. And most importantly, the people this is gonna affect the Hold most- on. are you charged with a crime? You're having your rights stripped away from you. Your firearms are being taken away. You're being treated as if you were charged with a crime and convicted of a crime. A right to late is a right denied. And by taking your guns away just for one day without any due process, without being charged with a crime, without having any evidence of crime, mm -hmm. just by sheer accusation, so, is a modern day witch hunt. Uh, Alejandro, let me ask you this. Um, <clears throat> first nine months of 2019, 21 deadly <clears throat> excuse me, mass shootings across the country, total of 124 people killed. El Paso, Dayton. This goes on. Hopefully, as we do this program toward the end of October, there will not be another one anytime soon. Children, you don't need me to talk to you about the horrific school-related shootings. What's your solution? Over 95% of these crimes that have occurred have occurred in gun-free zones. It's society's 
most cruelest experiment, which guarantees that criminals would have a, a defenseless uh, group of people that they can attack. And that's why these areas are targeted by criminals and so, mentally insane. Excuse me, interrupt. Do you believe that teachers should be armed? The places that have armed teachers have shown no evidence of any type of backlash or any type of so issues. So you believe teachers should be armed? I, I have firearm instructors that are competitive shooters that would like to be armed. There's principals, there's school administrators that would like to I'll have armed. I'll ask you one more time, just look for a yes or no. Do you believe teachers should be armed? I believe making the teachers defenseless, making the schools defenseless, is what attracts this crime. After the 1990 Gun-Free School Zone Act was indoctrinated, that's when school shootings skyrocketed. I'll take that as a yes. Go ahead. There is no proof that mass shooters target gun-free zones. Uh, I think if more guns made us safer, we'd be the safest nation in the world. Because? Because I don't think, they, I don't think more guns make us safer. I think um, the majority of mass shootings in this country are as actually domestic violence shootings. Well, go back to schools for a second. But yeah. if a teacher, if a principal, if someone in that school who was trained, right, mm -hmm. certified to have a handgun, mm -hmm. to have some kind of gun, are you saying that some of the horrific murders those shootings could not be limited on some level if someone had a gun? I don't know. There was, there was an armed guard in Parkland. There was an armed guard, I believe, in Columbine. Even sharpshooters only hit their target, I think, like 2% of the time or something. So just because someone is, just because someone is trained to use a gun does not mean that they're going to be effective in a, in a mass shooting situation. But can we agree that there's no one, quote, solution, but there are things that we can do Absolutely. to help minimize gun violence? Absolutely. So I'm going to ask you this, Al, if I could. Um, do, do, you, do, do you agree that universal background checks being discussed and debated, President Trump has said he's for it, he's against it, he's for it, he's against it, I'm not exactly sure as we take this program where he is, do you believe that universal background checks will help reduce gun violence? Well, let me just go back to the uh, Aurora shooter and the gun-free zone. He specifically drove past two other movie theaters 45 minutes out of his way because the movie theater he went to was a designated gun-free zone. That's why he went there. He passed two other movie theaters that allowed their, you know, the, the people that went to the movies to carry guns. So to make the argument that they don't target gun-free zones is absurd. It's FBI statistics. It's background shows. checks. Background Good checks. Good idea, right? We have universal background checks in New Jersey, and it still doesn't stop Federally. the criminals. Federally, across the country, we do not have universal background checks. Do you support the idea? There's if you been support no evidence of showing that universal background checks reduce crime. If that were the case, Camden, Newark, and Trenton, New Jersey would be gun-free. So I have no choice, respectfully, but to take that as a no, because you said New Jersey has universal background checks. Then I asked you about the country because there are 49 other states, and then you immediately argued that they're not effective. So I'm going to argue that if you, um, my assumption, is if you were in Congress, you'd vote against it. I would not support universal background checks because there's no. no evidence to prove that they work. But, but wait a minute. You're not convinced that they will help, but they won't hurt. What's the downside? Because there's no evidence to show that people are acquiring firearms through, universal, through the lack of the universal background is checks. Is there any change that you would make we in existing have, we gun have laws? Very are there strong any changes that you would make on the state or the national level as it relates to gun laws. Because every item I've raised, every idea I've raised, you said, quote, it won't work. What change, if any, would you make? In Parkland, this individual committed multiple felonies, yet he was never arrested. The fact of the matter is that Parkland occurred because the government failed to do their job. We have to enforce the laws that are in the books. You would make no changes in existing laws. We already have enough gun laws. They're not being enforced, so if we don't enforce the Can't current laws. Can't you give me a yes or a no? I'm giving you an explanation of no, why. No, but the answer is no. If you were in Congress, and you have a lot of opinions, mm -hmm. you would not try in any way to expand any existing, excuse me, to increase any of the laws, to add any laws to reduce gun violence, because right now you believe it's an enforcement question of the laws we have. That's what I heard. Am I mischaracterizing it? No, that's exactly what it is. Go ahead. H.R. 8 passed. H.R. 8, explain five, to folks what it is. H.R. 8 is the most comprehensive background check bill that's been in Washington in years. It passed with bipartisan support. It passed the House with bipartisan support. Democrats and, it's and Republicans. Been, yes. And it's been sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk for, I believe, like 200 days. Because? Because Mitch McConnell also answers to the gun lobby and the NRA leadership and not just well, his that, well, Wait a minute. That's, that's your opinion. True. Maybe just Mitch McConnell disagrees with it. Well, then he should. But if there are other senators that do, then he should call it for a vote.
and let them vote. That's an interesting point. Would you be in favor of a vote, an up or down vote on this particular, is HR 8, eight. if you will? You, comprehensive universal background checks. Let people decide, Democrats, Republicans, people who get support from the NRA or not. Let them vote, right? Mitch McConnell hasn't supported any gun legislation, including pro-gun legislation. No, I asked you, would you want to see a vote on it? Oh, I, it, you know, if people want to vote on it, that's Mitch McConnell's agenda, but I wouldn't support the legislation. Okay. Any agreement here? Well, I, I think we can agree to the fact, the state police has said that over the 700 shootings we have in New Jersey, that over 91% of them are occurred by the same people, recidivist offenders, that are already So what do you, agree, what do you agree on then? Well, why the, the fact is the government is not doing their job. So we're going to agree that the government's not doing their job. That's your colleague's argument. Mm -hmm. And do you agree with that? I believe that crime is an issue in New Jersey in these five specific cities, and I'm really happy that Governor Murphy, and maybe mm. we, can, we can agree on this, that they've started this hospital-based initiative program to help get into those neighborhoods where those, the, the gang crime is, where the inner city violence is, and mm -hmm. to help kind of stop the, stop the uh, help with the family, stop any kind of uh, retaliation, mm -hmm. get people the mental health help that they need. So okay. the government is trying to help. Mental health is a big piece of yeah. this. Uh, let me ask you a quick question before yeah. we go. President Trump, give him a grade on gun violence. D. Give President Trump a grade on gun violence. He's done a great job, and I'll give him an A. An A and a D. Okay. Listen, I want to thank both of you for joining us on Think Tank for a spirited, but as always, respectful dialogue. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are joined by Suzanne Spernal, who is Vice President of Women's Services, RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Uh, professional, excuse me, clinical background, APN, and advanced, play, advanced practice nurse. Yes. We have you on to talk about a whole range of issues having to do with maternal health. I want to get on this right away. As we were researching this program, there's something that struck me. 44 states deliver better maternal health outcomes than New Jersey. What? Why? So the, that's a good question, and the answer is a little complicated. So let's take a step back and talk about what a maternal death is, what maternal mortality is, and then maybe the why will make a little bit more sense. So a maternal death is a, um, a death that occurs anytime during pregnancy, um, d the day of delivery, and up to a year after the pregnancy is completed. And I think that a lot of people, when they hear the term maternal mortality or maternal death, they envision something, a catastrophic, catastrophic event that happens while a woman's delivering. In childbirth. Exactly, exactly. But, but we know that the majority of maternal deaths are occurring after mom gives birth and is back out in our communities. What is that, excuse me for interrupting, is that the 42 days after? Yes. What's so going from, on then? So it's a multitude of things, but the most common causes of maternal mortality in that time frame are ca uh, cardiac complications, um, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, women having blood clots, um, women having a stroke. And I think part of the problem is that there is a lack of awareness. Of um, what? Of Okay, so women out there right now, men and or women, but men concerned about the women in their lives. Thank you for saying that. What should they be looking for? So I think that women um, and their families and even their providers tend to minimize complaints that to for you or I, if we were to say it, um, would be probably benign. And I'll give you a good example, a headache. So Within one of the 42-day period after birth, yes. I get headaches. Right. Eh. I get headaches also. But what happens to a so, woman who's just given childbirth uh, 21 days after? Go ahead. So let's, let's make it even closer. Let's Go close ahead. that window a little bit. Let's say seven days after, mom's sleep deprived. Maybe she hasn't been uh, drinking enough water. Maybe she hasn't been eating well, and she's got this headache. And she's taken some pain relievers, and that headache's just not getting better. So her family, her support people, may say, you're just tired. You had a baby. You'll this be is fine. normal. You'll be fine. But? But it's a cardinal symptom of something called preeclampsia. Pre? Eclampsia. 
So that is when a woman's blood pressure um, is elevated. And sometimes it's elevated to a level that's quite concerning and can cause a woman to have a stroke. And um, so what we want women to know is, and their families, is not to minimize these symptoms. And we want ED providers because that's probably the first touch point, the Emergency right? department? Yes. Go ahead. So a woman go, presents to the emergency department and she says, I have a headache. So if I go to the emergency department and I say, I have a headache, they're going to say, okay, have a seat in the waiting room because it's probably not a big deal. But if a woman that's just had a baby says, I have a headache, that's a really big deal. And she Potential needs Potential stroke because time is brain. Yes, time is of the essence. And one of the things that we've taught the um, emergency department providers at RWJ Barnabas Health. By the way, to make it clear, RWJ Barnabas Health is a big supporter, significant supporter of public broadcasting uh, on many levels. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is that these women need to be expedited into care. And we've taught them that. They can't be treated like everyone else. Excuse exactly. me. I'm sorry for jumping no, in, Susan. No, that's great. Um, no, they can't be treated like everybody else. And the thresholds and the treatment algorithms are different than a woman in the general population. So what we've done to heighten that awareness in our system is we have put a trigger and alert system in our emergency department. Trigger and alert. Yes. So what that is is if a patient has had a baby in our healthcare system, and presents to the emergency department in that 42-day window when she is registered and alert fires. And it says, this patient's had a baby in the past 42 days. Because we know that sometimes when a mom is not feeling well, she may not self-identify. And we know that sometimes with all of the competing priorities in the emergency department, an ED provider may not think to ask that question. Mm. Um, and we know that those symptoms could be an indication of something very, very serious and life-threatening going on. We also have built in a second mechanism because what we know is sometimes, even though a woman chooses one hospital to have her baby, she may go to an emergency department that's closer to her home. Why is that relevant? It's really relevant because of that 42-day window. So Hold on one second. What is really going on with a woman, most women's bodies, including the brain function, and that 42-day window that we don't, some of us, so people don't the, understand. So it's through the whole pregnancy. Your body um, goes through a lot of changes to accommodate the um, hormones and the increased blood flow when a woman gets pregnant. And what happens is with these changes, there are some blood vessels in the brain that become more vulnerable to um, women having a stroke. So what may be a acceptable blood pressure for me for mm. a woman that's pregnant or has recently had a baby can cause her to have a stroke. And those thresholds are much different. Do this, uh, Suzanne uh, Spurnell, who is uh, talking to us about a whole range of issues having to do with maternal health. Give some advice to friends, family, those who are closest to those who are in, who are either having a child, who are in that period after having a child, who care deeply about wanting to be helpful. They're listening and watching right now. Go ahead. No one knows your body better than you. And if you're not feeling right, then ask questions. And if you're not satisfied with those answers, keep asking the questions till you get um, an answer that makes you comfortable. If you are um, a family member or a support person for someone that's pregnant or just had a baby, be their advocate if they can't advocate for themselves. Know that there's no symptom that should be minimized and that um, we need to... Don't blow it off. Don't blow it off. No big deal. Yeah, that, no. We should never be saying those words to women. Susanna, I thank you so much. You've thank provided you. a very important public service. Well done. Thank you. Okay. This is Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato, and we'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. A circus haven. We created Trenton Circus Squad to bring kids together, to work together, to learn from each other, and to enrich everybody. Trenton Circus Squad is one of the main places in Trenton to have fun and stay safe at the same time. It's a great place to be, and it's a great place to be yourself and hang out with everybody. When we perform, it's even better. Is 
Is that not the coolest thing? That is the Trenton Circus Squad. The gentleman right here, Tom Von Osen, is the executive director. You, by the way, set this up. We met during the Rustbury Awards for Making a Difference uh, this past year. What were we just seeing, and why did you just tell me while you're watching that this has been my dream? That's a <clears throat> typical scene in our factory. We're, we're located in downtown Trenton at one of the Roebling Wireworks factories. And you walk in and you see kids doing the most amazing things. And that's why we say we inspire kids to take huge leaps in life. And where does this whole thing come from? Uh, a partner and I co-founded it, Zoe Brooks and myself. Um, we use circus arts, which is a very inclusive type of art form where kids can come in, find success, and learn skills that change their lives. They tra transform their lives, and they realize that they can achieve amazing things. Why does it matter so much in a city like Trenton, our capital city in New Jersey? Again, it could be Newark, Jersey City, East Orange, Camden, anywhere, but why there? Well, our model is, is that we, we merge suburban kids with urban kids, and that's, that's a huge thing. So we're, we're bringing kids together that would never cross paths. So in our, in our area, we got Princeton, Lawrenceville, Hopewell, uh, it's got some wealthy Hamilton. communities. Exactly. So those kids come into Trenton, partner with the teenagers from Trenton, and because we see the Trenton kids every day, guess what? They're the ones that have the most amazing skills because they de develop and they practice What's them it like every day. when those kids get together? Um, they form strong relationships, and, and human contact is something that is in desperate need for this generation because of the, the impact of cell phones. They're, they're, they're losing but Actually, those well, hold skills. on, excuse me. Uh, Tom Von Osen from this great organization called Trenton Circus Squad. These kids are actually talking to each other? Believe it or not. They're, they're learning how to trust <laughs> each other and, and communicate and, and develop empathy. And it's, it's, it's something that draws them to the factory every day because that experience is not something that they experience every day in their lives anymore. Yeah. If anything, it's the opposite because they're on these phones and, and they don't know how to read people or, or sure. feel emotion or anything like that. Dare so. we use the term emotional intelligence yeah. and, and the lack thereof. You know, when I met you up at, it was Ramapo, that, mm -hmm. uh, Ramapo, the, the college there who did the, uh, they did the event, the Raspberry Awards for Making a Difference, that to disclose I've been honored for about 20 years to, to be hosting that incredibly uh, inspiring event where people who are making a difference every day, ordinary people, making extraordinary differences, as Angelica Berry uh, likes to say. Um, I remember meeting you, and one of the things that struck me about you, not, not just the work in this organization, but you have a circus background. I do. Talk about it. The first time I ran away to the circus was right out of but, high school. Hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> you can't use that expression. I ran away to the circus? Um, yeah. From where to where? Well, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in Princeton, and I wasn't quite ready for college and the investment that that was going to require. So <laughs> I, I saw an opportunity. My, my true love was, was theater and sports at that time. So I decided to enroll in an acting program in New York City, and that led to an audition or, or an application to the Ringling Brothers Barnaby Bailey Clown College. And I got accepted, and that's when I ran away. How did it change your life? It exposed me to the, uh, the, the skills which are, are a, incredibly challenging, whether it's unicycle riding or the aerials or clowning or juggling. I mean, it takes a lot of, a lot of uh, practice, a lot of teamwork, and persistence. I, I had no idea, persistence, and I had no idea that I would be doing this as a job, full-time job um, at my age. You did age. not? No. Um, I actually went back, I enrolled in college and got my, my degree, but then, but then later on, because I still enjoyed and saw the impact it was having on kids, um, I decided to, to do as a summer program. And when I incorporated the community service aspect, mm -hmm. that's when I realized this could be a full-time job because civic engagement is something that kids don't really look at fondly. Uh, they, they look at it as hours they have to complete. But uh, when, when you combine giving back to community and community building with the circus skills, these kids just wanted to keep doing it over and over and over. I'm curious about this, Tom. So, so way too many kids, one is too many, <clears throat> excuse me, are involved in gangs. They're adrenaline rush. They're involved they're together. It's a family in the eyes of some. To what degree? Can you even say whether this initiative, Trenton Circus Squad, has 
diverted some of those kids away from gang life into this particular group of people doing these things because it's a, a really healthy substitute? I know that's a loaded question. I think when the bottom line is every, every kid wants to feel belonged and they, right. and they want to be loved and feel appreciated. And express him or herself. And be able to express themselves and, and belong to, and, and, and that family environment. If you asked our kids why they come, they would, they would say because it's like a family. And, and, and they'll be, if, if they don't have a program, left. Go ahead. if they don't have a program that they're drawn to or they feel they belong to, then they'll look for other ways. And I think that's when they start, uh, start making bad choices and, 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 and joining things that uh, don't have much of a future. Well, Tom Van Ossen, you're making good choices and doing a good thing with the Trent Circus Squad. Well done. Thank you. Keep Thank it up. you. Okay. Living my dream. I, I hear you. Same here. That's why I'm here. Uh, live in mine. And that's it for this edition of Think Tank, which was a dream we all had. So if you like Think Tank, you're going to love Think Tank, the podcast. It's going to be on Apple, not going to be, it is on Apple Podcasts and Google Play, where you can hear conversations just like the one we had with Tom, but also with exclusive commentary and analysis available only on Think Tank, the podcast. So watch us here, listen to us online, and remember, most importantly, make sure you think for yourself. I'm Steve Adubato, checking out check you out next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, PSENG, ADP, the New Jersey Education Association, NJIT, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Promotional support provided by NJ.com and by New Jersey Family Magazine and NJFamily.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time, I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion. 